I'm going to take, going to take that as a yes. All right. So, um, what we saw in the in the first in the, the first part was step index, right? So you have a core index uh, and a cladding index. Those values are constant in in that uh, zone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in that zone, and there's only two of them. So, another type of waveguide is called the graded index waveguide. So what happens is when your core index, instead of being a fixed value, is a value that depends on the position where you're at uh, in the, in the waveguide, right? So now what happens is instead of having reflection points, is uh, your beam bends through uh, through the material, okay? And so your reflection points are uh, replaced with inflection points. And so what happens is instead of having these sharp triangles, now what we have are these pseudo sinusoidal curves uh, that's, that are going to wave through, uh, that are going to uh, oscillate through the, uh, the waveguide. Now, if, if you uh, really want to go into depth, uh, you can look up Fermat's principle in graded index uh, optics. And that, like, that is the real explanation of uh, what happens and the derivation of the equations that describe it. Uh, so very shortly, Fermat's principle states that light rays will always travel along the path that uh, that has the least uh, the, sh the shortest travel time, or equivalently uh, equivalently uh, the shortest optical path. Okay, so it's given by uh, this uh, this expression right here. So the integral of uh, the index of refraction along the path of the ray, its derivative is equal to zero. Uh, and if you take if you take this equation uh, and you do some uh, calculus of variations, you can derive three differential equations for each of the axes in your uh, in your three D system, um, or you can write it in vector form, <clears throat> which is this one. And then for demonstration purposes, in our case, we have a one D system. So the only direction in which the index of refraction n is varying is in the x direction. Uh, and in the y and z, it's uh, it's staying constant. So then we're we're left with a single expression uh, right here. Okay. So um, what we're the first thing that we're going to do here uh, is we're going to look at this equation and how uh, you can use it to derive what the actual ray path is through the material, right? Um, so before. Okay, yeah. So one thing that's in, that's important to notice is if you look at your graded index waveguide uh, using Snell's law, right? So if you zoom on one single point, the index between, okay, so here it's y, but just imagine this is x. Uh, the index at this value is n of x, and the index at this value is n of x plus delta x, right? It's a very, very small change. Um, Snell's law says that any uh, any uh, ray of light that goes from one index to uh, another value uh, will be refracted according to the uh, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, or equivalently um, n1 cos theta, where you use, instead of the incidence angle, you use uh, this angle here. Okay, so what happens is, this equation, so when your beam is entering your, uh, your waveguide, um, it starts somewhere along the waveguide at a, an index value n0, right? So depending on the position in x, uh, the, the index is n0, and the angle of that ray is equal to theta0, okay? So if we look at the next point right next to it, it's going to be equal to the index at that position a little bit higher or lower, times the new angle cos theta one. So the light will bend a little bit uh, to match kind of the change in the index of refraction. And that's also going to be true for every single step after that. So this equation here is just a long chain of equalities where you have the index of refraction times the cosine of the angle um, at that point is always equal to the previous one and all the other ones before that, right? And that is the ray invariant for graded index waveguides. Okay, so once you know, <clears throat> excuse me, once you know the uh, the n zero, which is the index 
of refraction on input and the theta zero, which is the angle of the, of the ray on the input, you know everything you need to know about that ray. Okay? <clears throat> so, oh, that's silly. Okay, I put the answer right there. Okay, well, the, the question is, under which conditions are the rays guided uh, and under which uh, are they refracted at the core, uh, core cladding interface? Okay, so the answer is, well, can anybody try and give an, uh, their own answer just qualitatively? Uh, when will rays be uh, refracted? So when will they leave the core? Does the question make sense? Come on, guys, I'm talking to myself here. All right. So, oh, sorry. I would, I want to say it depends on the angle on which it, uh, um, it, which would be reflected or interact. If the angle is too big, it, um, it refracts. And if it's okay. too small, it's, uh, it's reflected. Okay, so now now consider this: the angle, uh, sorry, the the index of the uh, core. So at, let's say this line right here is the core cladding interface. Um, at that interface, the index of the core is almost perfectly equal to the index of the cladding. What happens then? So if, if N1 equals N2, what is your uh, critical angle? Uh, would it be zero? Yeah. So, yeah, it's zero. It's zero. So that means and that anything, any, any ray of light that's bigger than zero is going to refract through the, uh, through the, um, uh, through, through the surface, right? Yeah. So then, the only way for the only way for the um, the ray to not exit the waveguide is for it to already be at zero at that uh, at that index at that edge position. Okay, and mathematically, what that means is if you take this chain, you know, this chain of uh, equalities here. So the initial position is n zero cos theta zero, and then the second one is n x n one cos theta one, and so on and so forth. When you reach <clears throat> when you reach the edge, um, the only way that the ray stays inside of the um, of the uh, the waveguide is if theta at that point is equal to zero. <clears throat> and so what that means is that the beta critical is uh, is simply equal to the index of the cladding. So then, if you take your if you take your ray with an initial index, an initial, um, or rather this, this part right here, an initial index and an initial um, angle. If that value, that multiplication is greater uh, than the, um, sorry, not, not greater, smaller, smaller than the index of the cladding, then your ray will be uh, refracted and it will be lost. Does that make sense to everybody? <clears throat> Yes. Yes. Those uh, those who don't want to turn on mics, just also uh, give me a yes no in uh, in chat, please. It's clear. All right. Fantastic. So then the second question, which is very similar, is um, at which point? How do you calculate the height at which your ray will uh, turn around? So it will become flat and will turn into the other direction. Does anybody want to take a guess? All right, um, Cyril, you're top of the list. I, I would say you use Snell's laws to determine the um, critical angle. So the, que the question is, at which, 
x position, um, so at which uh, height in the waveguide will the ray turn around? How would you how would you find that? Um. I don't know. All right, that's that's, uh, that's okay. David, you're up next. <clears throat> mm. Maybe you could solve the the equation, differential equation, for at which point the. Uh... That's true. That's true. That that's the more. That's what we're going to do in a second. Um, let's say you don't know what the. Uh, you don't know what the uh, the expression is for the the beam. So let's say you don't solve the. Uh, <clears throat> think think uh, think about the 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 kind of thought process that we just had. When does the ray stay in the uh, in the in the the waveguide um, when it hits the interface here? So it only it only it only stays in the waveguide when the beam is already going at zero degree when it's already turning around, right? So then what you can do is you can just set uh, your beta uh, or your n zero cos theta zero or this one rather equals to um, n something uh, times cos theta uh, let's say one or two or twenty. But cos, but theta at that point is also equal to zero, and basically what that's going to do is it's going to tell you which uh, index you're going to be at when you uh, when the beam starts turning. Okay. Yep. All right. So another um, another interesting thing that you can do uh, is you can actually use this law to uh, so Snell's law to uh, derive uh, this same equation. So the the more complicated way is using Fermat's principle and then variation uh, uh, calculus of variations and so on and so forth. Um, my favorite way, which is the easier way, um, is to use this equation that we have right here. So I'm just going to run through it uh, quickly. What we have is we have this chain of um, this chain of uh, equalities. If we just look at the first one. And we put it in terms of uh, x and delta x. What happens is you have uh, the index at a certain position times the cosine of the angle at that position is equal to the index at the next position times the angle at or the cosine of the angle at the next position, right? So when when you use uh, then what you can do is you can use um, a Taylor series expansion or just a series expansion which states that the um, if you have a function uh, and you're evaluating at x plus delta x, then that function is just the value at x plus that delta times uh, the derivative, uh, the slope of the function. Now, if you insert this in here, you get uh, the expression uh, right here. So what happens is here you have a chain derivative where you're you're deriving, uh, you're doing the derivative of cos theta x plus delta x. So then you get uh, you have to do the yeah the chain uh, chain derivative rule, and you end up with uh, this expression. Okay, so you have n times cos theta equals n times cos theta, and all these following terms. Uh, the n times cos theta cancel out, and you're left with uh, the um, yeah, the the other terms, which are delta x cos theta, and then the derivative of the index relative to x, or well, just basically these terms right here. The first thing that you see is that you can factor out a delta x um, from both sides, and so you, those cancel out, and you're left with cos theta d n d x times n sine theta d uh, d theta d x times delta x sine theta d theta d x d n d x. Now, if you take this um, this reasoning to the in the limit as delta x goes to zero, basically this term right here falls um, falls to nothing. Next. Um, what you do is you use something called the paraxial approximation, and that's something that you're going to see a lot in, uh, in optics. Um, it's something that we like to do because it makes life uh, a lot simpler. 
uh, but it is valid in this instance. Um, the paraxial approximation is that most of your, or uh, is that your rays are very close to being parallel with the optical axis. Okay, so your rays, in the diagrams that I've been showing, you always see these rays that are highly inclined. Uh, in practice, when you take real scenarios, this is never the case. It's always very, very flat rays um, that are almost, uh, almost uh, horizontal. Okay, so when you have this approximation, uh, you can say that 10 theta is equal to sine theta is equal to theta. And theta in this instance is just the derivative of x relative to z. So then you can take this expression right here and simplify it uh, to, to this one. And what you get out of that is the same, uh, the same expression um, as you got with the Fermat's principle, okay? So that's how you solve for, in order to get the uh, partial differential equation, uh, sorry, the, the differential equation that you can use to solve for the true path of your rays in the, the medium. So <clears throat> let's, uh, so we were just, what we were looking at was the, um, the uh, general case for graded index profiles. So we, in, in this slide, we kind of had no idea what the, uh, the profile N of X was. But one of the profiles that's of interest is called the parabolic uh, index profile, which has the following, uh, the following expression. So it's uh, n squared equals n0 squared times um, this quadratic term. Uh, what happens in practice, so if you take the square root of that, you end up with this expression. And what happens is pra in practice is that the term here, alpha, um, uh, the, sorry, the multiplication of alpha squared x squared uh, over two is always very, very small compared to one. And in that case, in that case, you can take the approximation that uh, you, you remove the square root uh, and you add the, uh, the one half factor here, okay? So then if we take the general equation that we derived uh, in the previous slide and we insert uh, this expression in there, what happens is uh, you have here um, yeah, you have, you get this expression right here. Now, the first thing you have to notice is that uh, the, this term, one minus one half a x squared and so on and so forth, is it's still the same thing holds here. So one minus this value is still very, very close to one. So what happens is you cancel this out and then the two n zero factors uh, cancel out and you end up with Minus, oh, I forgot. I forget. Yeah, I forgot a, a negative term. So you end up with this expression right here. Uh, does this does does anybody want to take a guess as to what the solution for x of z is, uh, given this differential equation? It's an easy one. All right, uh, next on the list is uh, Professor Faber. He's still even there. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was here, but I was not looking at slides, actually. Uh, it's okay, it's okay. Okay, <laughs> Abe, do you wanna take a guess? Yeah, I don't know, sorry. All right, um, all right. Does anybody does anybody have an idea? Going once. You yeah. just have to put z behind a uh, uh -huh. to the power second x. Mm -hmm. And what's the what's the solution of that? All right. So the uh, the solution of uh, whenever you have uh, an equation that's like this. So the second derivative is equal to minus a squared times uh, the function itself. Uh, the solution is something uh, is a time is like a factor times the cosine uh, plus like a, a linear sum of the cosine and the sine function. Okay. So in this case, uh, the solution to the differential equation, uh, if you do, uh, you solve the differential equation and then you use your uh, your uh, boundary conditions, 
so the boundary con conditions are that at x of zero, so x of zero being this edge of your waveguide, uh, you have a certain height. Oh, okay. Sorry, this should be um, this should be x zero, not y zero. Um, you have a certain height x zero, and you have a certain angle. Uh, given that you have those two uh, initial uh, values, then uh, you can basically figure out what the ray path is for uh, for any ray. Okay. So what's interesting about this parabolic index is that you see that no matter um, <clears throat> No matter where the, uh, so if, if we assume that the initial point is in the center, uh, it doesn't matter which angle you send, uh, they will always uh, come back together after um, a, a certain half period or period, okay? Now, what's really interesting, the reason why parabolic index profiles are so interesting is if, um, Okay, let me ask you uh, uh, the question rather. Which rays have the longest geometrical path length? The, the blue one in the picture? Uh, okay, Let, let's uh, admit me. Yeah, so the blue ones, uh, that's true. So uh, dark blue and light blue, the ones on the outside, yeah. right? Because it makes sense. Oh. Yeah, sorry? Uh, I didn't see that that was too blue. <laughs> yeah. Never mind. So you're, you're absolutely right on the, the ones on the outside. So the top one and the bottom one have the longest geometrical path length. So now here's a trick question. Which one has the longest optical path length? The middle one, Steph. Why? Uh, because it's a trick question. <laughs> That's a good answer. Okay, any, <laughs> anybody take a guess as to why? Uh, well, the breaking index is uh, is higher there, so you put uh, multiply by a higher number. Which exactly. <laughs> but actually, what happens? Higher. What happens is so your 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 reasoning is exactly right. But actually, what happens is that the um, the average. So if you if you take the the increase in path length uh, due of the outer rays is compensated by a lower refractive index. So what happens is that the actual optical path length of all the rays is much much closer together. It's almost they're almost all equal. So now you have this thing. This, so whenever you have a waveguide that has gradient index, uh, a gradient index profile that's a parabolic uh, profile, so that follows this equation, um, what happens is you have a lot less modal dispersion. So I ran over it earlier quickly, but modal dispersion is um, what you call the difference in uh, group velocities between your different modes. Okay, it's, it's a variation, it's the variation of um, how fast each one of your modes travels through your waveguide. And so if you have step index waveguides, as we saw in the example, you can have quite significant modal dispersion. So some modes will go a lot faster than others, and that can be problematic for certain applications. Uh, when you have graded index profiles, you have um, a, a start of a, of a solution uh, to this. So in this, uh, yeah, in this, for graded index uh, profiles, all the modes are going to be much closer together. So if you send the pulse, it's going to stay uh, more or less the shape that it was on input. OK? So that was like a short intro to the, uh, the waveguides, planar waveguides. Um, the, key, the key message here is that uh, in order for, geometrically speaking, in order for a, a waveguide to guide light, um, there has to be total internal reflection, so no light can be lost. Otherwise, as soon as you have a little loss, it stacks over the all the interactions, and then you end up losing it all. Uh, there are different index profiles. So the two that I showed are step index, gradient index. Um, there are many, many more. And each one of these index profiles generates a different ray trajectory, so a different ray path. Um, you can 
some what some people do is they uh, play on that index profile in order to achieve very specific uh, ray traje trajectories that have certain properties. Um, different ray paths, different so different ray paths, different trajectories, or different modes. That's one of the key words here. Can have different path lengths and propagation speeds. Um, you have every trajectory, every mode is characterized by an effective index with a beta bar. Uh, the parabolic index profile minimizes modal dispersion, and then you have chromatic dispersion, um, which is the impact of different wavelengths moving at different speeds. Okay. Um, I have a 10 minute break here uh, planned in. Um, does anybody uh, need 